I'm delighted to be introducing Françoise Meltzer, who uh, did her MA and PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. She's taught there, uh, as well as at Cornell and at the University of Chicago, where she's been for uh, most of her career, I believe. And she's Edward Carson Waller, Distinguished Professor, uh, and uh, is in the faculty of, in the Department of French, Comparative Literature, Divinity, humanities, have I forgotten anything else? I'm not in French anymore. Oh, you're not in French any longer, okay. Uh, and she's the author of several books, uh, Salome and the Dance of Writing, so Stephen Broom should be here. We have a faculty member very interested in dance. Salome and the Dance of Writing, um, 1987, Hot Property, The Stakes and Claims of Literary Originality, 1994, for Fear of the Fire, Joan of Arc and the Limits of Subjectivity, 2001, Seeing Double, Baudelaire's Modernity, uh, 2011, and uh, forthcoming, or in progress, Berlin, 1945, Les de la Souffrance, uh, which this paper is connected to. Uh, she's also edited and translated uh, much work, and she's written a huge number of articles. Most notably, um, Signature Derrida and uh, Exploding Poetry, a translation of Georges Poulet, uh, The Trials of Psychoanalysis, and going a little bit deeper into her CV, I see that she translated Rob Grier and Starobinsky, um, some of my favorite, and, and uh, Bruce Morisset as well, who wrote on Rob Grier, some of my favorites when I was um, a graduate student, which I'm afraid maybe dates both of us. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I will cease. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here today. And I want to particularly thank um, Tilotama Rajan and Chris Keep for inviting me. Here. You're very lucky to have a program like this. I think it's terrific. Uh, I wish we had something like mm -hmm. that. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to talk here, even though obviously it would be better if I were there, because I need to push these buttons here. And I'm told that there's no way of lowering the lights. Can you see this image? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. OK. So this is part of a book I'm working on having to do with Germany in 1945. Um, it's based on a series of photographs that are in my family archive. So they're photographs, not the first one of these, all these. There's another series that I'm going to show you that have obviously never been published and which are going to be part of the book with a text running underneath. The text is not going to talk about the photographs, like here is where the, you know, something was before and after the war. It's now a Kaufhaus für alle or something. Um, it's uh, simply going to use the question, um, as I will be discussing, of how we look at such photographs, how the gaze is constructed in looking. So this is a kind of partial aspect having to do with how the Romantics viewed ruins and moving up to why what's going on in Berlin in 1945 poses different problems. So it's a little bit of a medley of what this book is about. So Chateaubriand, the French romantic writer, wrote that all men have a secret attraction to ruins. This feeling, he continues, stems from the fragility of our nature, from a secret conformity between the destroyed monuments and the rapidity of our existence. So this passage marks a kind of romantic attitude par excellence, and I know I'm among many experts in romanticism, and I'm quite aware of the difference between English, French, which is almost not romantic at all, and in, in that literary sense, and uh, German. I'm, I'm very aware of that, but will you forgive me if I use the generic term romantic, just for today? OK. Um, so the reason I think this is a romantic attitude by Xenos is because it's trained, has a gaze trained on two considerations. On the one hand, the long passage of time and the erosion that slowly produces ruins. On the other hand, the fleeting and fragile character of human life. For Chateaubriand, ruins thus trace the synthesis of a paradox, 
long duration and fleetingly transitory are joined by a secret conformity. The end of all things is ineluctably accomplished by time, be it great but crumbled empires reclaimed by nature and remaining only as rubble. By the way, people who work on ruin are very obsessed with the distinction between rubble and ruin. I don't know what that's about. Um, I'm sure, as my father used to say, nothing a good psychoanalyst couldn't explain. <laughs> uh, be it great but crumbled empires reclaimed by nature only as rubble and fragments, or the individual who, in contemplating the ruins, is forced to face his or her own mortality and smallness in the immensity of time. <clears throat> ruins inspire contemplation in this period and engender what we might call the suspension, or at least the feeling of self and self-diminishment. But of course, this self is the modern concept conceived by the Enlightenment. So you could ask, haven't ruins always provoked a contemplation of the self? Not exactly. Greek authors under Roman rule were already nostalgically reimagining the reunified and glories of old Greece. Pausanias, Pseudo-Longinus, and Dio of Prusa attempt to rebuild through ruins the totality of a lost Greek past. So transient and frail are the affairs of men, writes Pausanias, as he contemplates what is left of Arcadia. His concern is, however, for fortune. All are subject to fortune's mutations, or fate. For her, quote, resistless force sweeps them along at her will. Now, Thucydides, in what I think is a fascinating passage, imagines the ruins of Sparta and Athens in the future but for the purpose of properly estimating their former power. For the Renaissance, and I'll get back to that, I think it's really interesting. For the Renaissance, ruins serve above all to reconstruct the past from remnants. Petrarch, after his visit to Rome in 1337, writes to a friend to describe what he calls a broken city. But he doesn't describe the ruins, and rather limits himself to imagining the precise location of this or that historical event. For Petrarch, ruins elicit a collective memory. No surprise here, as scholars of the Middle Ages have shown, I'm thinking of Dumont and Dupré, for instance, the medieval subject, still dominant at the time of Petrarch, exists as a communitarian entity. His or her I, mainly obviously his, as we understand it today, exists only in prayer. In other words, the individual exists with respect to God. With respect to others, he or she is a link in the social chain. So it's a very different notion of subjectivity, right? The 15th century measures and studies ruins and worries about transforming them into monuments. Ruins are the occasion for comparing the gap between the present and ancient civilizations. And I mean, obviously, I'm galloping through the ages, but it's just to sort of give you a sense. In the 16th century, the topographer and engraver Etienne du Perec makes an album of Roman monuments and ruins with imagined reconstructions. So I'm going to show you a before and after, which is really an after and before. You see what I mean? This is what it looks like in Duperac's time, right? And this is his reconstruction of it. Dedicated <clears throat> in 306, these imperial baths were the most sumptuous, continually expanded and improved upon by a succession of emperors. With Duperac, we have a perspective that ponders the reemergence of an empire and that dreams of a political space in order to prepare for a new future. Duperac's drawings give a precise visual report of the state of the ruins, which was over 500 years ago, and gives us a good glimpse into the ruins of the eternal city before the pillaging that was to follow. But let me repeat here, Duperac is pragmatic. He depicts ancient ruins in order to prepare the construction of the future as his era represents it to himself. And of course, the 16th century is also has this great event in the history of ruins in the West, the discovery of Pompeii and Herculaneum, as well as a few other ancient cities near Naples. But archaeological digs only began in 1748, 15 years later, Winkelmann publishes his famous book, and the Grand Tour, that interesting manner in the upper classes of combining culture with a certain discretion. One doesn't want to see newlyweds in society for at least a year. 
the grand tour is once again all the vogue after these archaeological findings. In France, England, and the German states, to mention just the most obvious, the well-to-do traveled to admire the ancient ruins of Italy and Greece. The 18th century is obsessed with ruins. Uh, I should say that in the 18th century, it's very in to build fake ruins in your garden. Uh, this is an example of such a fake ruin. It's Hagley Hall in England, built mid-18th century to look like a ruined medieval castle. And such fake ruins remain the rage in the 19th century. Uh, in fact, if you go to the Parc Monceau in Paris, you will see this fake ruins and that fake ruins. So at the end of the 18th century, one begins to see what will become what I would call the romantic gaze. On the grand tour, it becomes increasingly de rigueur to wallow in melancholy when viewing these traces, these fragments of a lost past. Diderot, for example, in his Salon of 1767, ponders a work by Hubert Robert, who was meant to be the great painter of ruins. Here is Robert's Port of Rome. Diderot invents the term, the poetry of ruins, and emphasizes the theme of sorrow. Ruins, he writes, inspire a sweet melancholy. The philosopher resorts to the classical planctus and the ubi sunt, as in where are the snows of yesteryear, where are those who died, and so forth. Here is Diderot declaiming about Robert's painting. Where are the peoples who raised these monuments? Into what huge, mute, and obscure depths will my eye wander? Time stops for he who admires. How little I have lived, exclamation mark. How brief was my youth. And in the same vein, I see the marble of tombs fall into dust, and I do not want to die. Diderot, as usual, <coughs> is enjoying a string of cliches he's producing, and he is nothing if not continually ironic. But at the same time, he emphasizes the paltriness of the I, an I based, as I've said, on individuality, a fundamental tenet <coughs> of the Enlightenment. But here the individual is dwarfed before the ruins. Diderot continues, a torrent carries off nations, one on top of the other, into a common abyss, and I, I alone, claim that I can stop at the edge and staunch the flow that rushes on either side of me. So why do I say a shift occurs here? And that in Diderot's comments, we can sense the beginnings of what will be called Romanticism. We can compare it with a sonnet on ruins by Du Bellay, the 16th century French poet, who, among other things, brought the sonnet to France. Du Bellay sits in front of Roman ruins and chooses to speak to the dead, pitying them. The ruins for him are full of pale spirits and dusty shades. Don't you feel your sorrow increase, he asks the phantoms among the ruins, when these Roman hillsides you contemplate the work of your hands and see that it is nothing more than a powdery plain. Note how the poet pities the phantoms wandering around the ruins while he, Du Bellay, is pensive but safely on this side of the river Styx, let us say. Here there's no question of the smallness of the eye. It is a question of the ghost sadness at seeing the great edifices produced by one's living hands turn to powder. To see one's entire culture, one's past, destroyed by little such that all becomes dust. So let's return to Hidoro. And note that despite his effusions on ruins in front of this painting, he does not finally like Robert's painting. There are too many people, too much noise, and movement. Can you see it? OK. So Diderot advises Robert to study Claude Vernet, the French painter. Learn from him to draw, to paint. Here's a. Uh, this is ruins near the mouth of the river, 1748. And Diderot continues to lecture at Robert. Since you have dedicated yourself to the painting of ruins, 
Know that this genre has its own poetics. You seem utterly unaware of this. Look for it. You have the ability, but you lack the ideal. A single man who could have wandered in this obscurity, his arms crossed on his breast and his head bowed, such a man could have affected me more. Monsieur Robert, you do not yet know why ruins are so pleasing. Uh, so I'm going to skip a lot of this Diderot, but one imagines that the famous portrait of Goethe, painted by Tischbein three years after Diderot's death, corresponds fairly closely to what the philosopher wanted in the representation of ruins. Very famous painting, right, that you notice. No noise, no movement, no other people. 1787. Piranesi, an exact contemporary of Diderot, will become the great painter of ruins, tableau in which there are, in fact, fewer and fewer people. This is the Colosseum, as I'm sure most of you know. Colosseum. And <coughs> the Arch of Constantine from 1760 with the Colosseum in the background. So, between Dubin and Diderot, I've noted there's the modern notion of individuality, and this, I would argue, helps to explain the shift I alerted to, <coughs> alluded to earlier. Elaborated by the Enlightenment, the notion of the individual prepares the terrain for the eye that we recognize today. And of course, science for the Enlightenment opens all doors and leads to the truth. And reason, without religion, I'm thinking of course of Kant here, will allow the individual to disassociate himself from the collective, to think for himself, supposedly, right? To refuse to be told how to think. So the notion of solitude as a privileged state inevitably followed. Kant's first critique, which I'm obsessed with, let me just say, so I'm going to control myself, um, <laughs> argued that how we see things is not necessarily how they in fact are. The result was to throw man back into the solitude of his own mind, such that, as Kierkegaard put at the end of the century, subjectivity is the only truth. In other words, if you can't trust what you're seeing, you know what you're feeling. So perhaps it is this emphasis on subjectivity that explains in part the romantic obsession with sentiment, including the melancholy that ruins are said to inspire. But the ruin engages and even provokes two principal aspects here, the gaze and the question of subjectivity. The gaze, of course, has been there from the start, but implicit in the notion of the eye is a rejection of reason as the savior of humanity. In 19th century French literature, there are texts filled with ruins and melancholy, as I'm sure you know, by the likes of Lamartine, Renan, Madame de Stal, Volney, uh, Verlaine, Baudelaire, Flaubert, Coppé, Gauthier, Nerval, Stendhal, and Hugo. Proust was thrilled by, by the way, Hugo was a very good draftsman and artist himself. He was a very good drawer. And, but he was also very egotistical. And so every drawing he made has an H in it. <laughs> and I, I don't have time to show you all that, but it's great. Um, if you read Les Travailleurs de la Mer and, and you see the octopus, the famous octopus, it's, it's making H's with its tentacles. Um, anyway, so remember that next time you see a drawing by Hugo. All of these, and, and of course, let's not forget the, you know, Byron, Kelly, Kelly and Sheets, right? <laughs> As Dorothy Parker said, a trio of lyrical treats. Um, uh, and, of course, Goethe and Schiller, to name only two from the German states. The visual arts are, of course, rife with ruined paintings during the whole of the 19th century. All of these writers and painters, infused as they are with the romantic sensibility, instinctively perform in their work what Guillermo had demanded of Robert. Few people, little noise, solitude, and very often a gloomy landscape. So every major romantic thinker in France and German, in the German states and in England at some point writes about ruins as if a landscape of the traces, heaps, and rubble of previous civilizations provided furniture for the installation of solitary thought. Artists and painters generally of the period not only follow suit, 
but are frequently the forerunners of romantic ruin obsession and the malaise that undergirds it. I think Tischbein's Goethe is a prime example. Ruins engage what Longinus, Burke, Kant, and others, of course, call the sublime, a greatness without calculation, or as Zizek puts it, a material object elevated to the status of an impossible thing. Ancient ruins are not, you will say, impossible, because there they are in front of us. And yet, in a sense, they are impossible, for they speak of a past that will never be present again, enacting the passing of time and individual mortality. But they're also the reminders and remainders of great empires which even dust and erosion can't erase. Indeed, in some ways, seem to increase, render grander. Ruins are at once monuments and fragments, reminders of totality and broken victims of time's passage. There's a mysterious disposition in man, remember, said Constant, a religious sentiment that philosophy is incapable of expressing and of which ruins are the triggers. Define the wind groaning among the ruins, he says. And he adds, philosophy cannot do it. Many writers of this period and even post-romanticism, although I'm not sure that we are in fact post-romanticism, note that description itself is powerless in the face of ruins. By what linguistic mode, as one recent critic, could ruins be described? Always by a light, he concludes, for ruins can only be depicted by a detour, by analogy, comparison, metaphor. Walter Benjamin puts it succinctly, allegories, he said famously, <clears throat> are in the realm of thought, what ruins are in the realm of things. Ruins, that is, illustrate, just as the image suggests, that which cannot be described. They illustrate the incapacity of description. They are symptoms of something like an erasure between knowledge and its phenomenal evidence. Benjamin says the ruin suggests a dialectic uh, in, in this regard, and I would add that it suggests a dialectic of inside, outside, very much like what Hegel talks about with respect to the hand. Uh, which is also inside outside, you will remember. Or it resembles Zimmel's notion of the handle of a vase as being both in the world of reality and in that of pure idea. Ruins seem to elicit an unseen even as they are only visually assimilated by the mind. In what initially appears to be an anti-romantic perspective, Derrida begins his memoirs of the blind the self-portrait and other ruins with a questioning of knowledge vested in the visual. There can be no pure visual experience in any form of contemplation because vision is always structured by a certain blindness, right? That's the argument. What he calls the hypothesis of sight or the intu intuitive hypothesis. And Derrida adds that this is especially the case for the auto-portrait. While the contemplation of ruins here too is grounded in the visual, it is obviously not a contemplation based on touch, or at least not initially, or the auditory, unless you're talking about the wind going through the ruins. As such, contemplation has its blindness, its intuitive hypothesis in which the gaze is always already somewhat predetermined. Indeed, in another text on ruins, Derrida will connect the visual directly to the ruin, but by way of the blindness of the empty eye socket. The ruin is for him neither a spectacle, nor a theme, nor something in front of us, nor a love object. It is experience itself. Ruin is, he says, rather this memory open like an eye, or like the hole in a bone socket that lets you see without showing you anything at all, anything of the all. But in insisting that the ruin does not let one see anything of the all, I think Derrida's ventriloquizing Lacan here, but never mind. Anyway, but insisting that the ruin does not let one see anything of the all, Derrida nonetheless conjures up a nostalgia for some kind of an all. Right? The book on the ruins of Athens of Derrida's is focused on a sentence that haunts him throughout the text. We owe ourselves to death, is the sentence. Nous devons à la mort. Thus, Derrida turns the eye-blindness equation around in ruin gazing. 
The empty eyes of death, the hole in a bone socket, stare out at us, and we are left blind, seeing without being shown anything of the all. And yet the inability to see any of the, all, anything of the all, I would argue, returns us to the romantics. Fragments remain, and some sort of total, tal, one, two, three, totality <laughs> haunts. Um, as in, for example, in Friedrich Schlegel's no, notion of fragments, which are like fractures, uh, uh, fractions, I'm having trouble speaking, fractions, um, the upper reminding you of the whole which is below it, right? And in fact, Novalis talks about this. Um, so to return this to the romantics, fragments remain and some sort of total totality haunts a memory of an all that, as Hegel points out, is only superficially belied by the view among the ruins of, quote, change at large. Derrida, then, is not so far from the romantic perspective as his pensive text on the ruins of ancient Athens professes to be. Geth becomes here a dark divinity of sorts, or at least an absolute that, much to Derrida's apparent consternation, cannot be negotiated. If ruin reconstruction is fascinating and historical for Du Perrac, as I noted earlier, for the romantic, such rebuilding takes place in the mind and is inspired by nostalgia. And there's a whole thing about nostalgia you probably know about etymologically. It, it's Greek, but it never existed in ancient Greek. Um, it was discovered by a 17th century doctor in Switzerland, and the cure was considered to be going to the Alps. In any case. Uh, in George Zimmel's 1911 essay, Ruins, he says, the ruin often seems tragic to us, for the destruction it embodies does not senselessly emerge from the exterior, but rather from the recognition of a tendency inherent in the deepest layers of what has been destroyed. And by the way, there's a whole aspect of this that is uh, relevant to Freud, for whom memory and the unconscious are likened to the layers of archaeological dig and to ruins. So we can talk about that if you're interested. Moreover, writes Zimmel, the ruin is a tragic comedy. Each ruin is an object saturated with our nostalgia. When we speak of going home, we are speaking of the peace that surrounds the ruin. Intentionality, this is still Zimmel, <coughs> intentionality and accident, nature and spirit, present and past, all are united in the ruin. End quote. In other words, as Zimmel himself will point out, in ruins, all contradictory <coughs> desires are united. As if, I would add, nostalgia were an ache for home, the past, and a glance from the future that sees the present in ruins. Such a glance as if from the future of the ruins is a curious perspective and one that has been around, I repeat, at least in Thucydides. It is that ancient historian, you will recall, who imagines Athens and Sparta in ruins at some distant point in the future and worries, I think this is wonderful, that the archaeologist of the future will draw the wrong conclusions concerning the relative power of the two cities. Thucydides writes, suppose the city of Sparta to be deserted and nothing left but temples and the ground plan. Distant ages would be very unwilling to believe the power of the Lacedaemonians was at all equal to their fame. So he concludes that we must be wary and judge cities by their power and not by their ruins. The passage is remarkable, I think, in its prescience and in its awareness of the limitations of the present in writing the history of an ancient past. But you will notice there's no nostalgia here. Rather, we have a corrective to retrospective historical views. On the other hand, some of you may remember Baudelaire's swan poem, which describes precisely the double-edged nostalgia of a past and future. So Baudelaire walked in Paris of the 1850s when you will remember the entire city is being torn apart by Osman. He looks at the rubble that is medieval Paris, destroyed to make room for the wide avenues that will be the new city. But the future P Paris is also in ruins, as it were, since the city is littered with as yet unbuilt edifices, partial facades, columns, building blocks, unfinished structures, and all the rubble and dust 
that such construction entails. So this is a focal. That is a bad photograph, or at least badly presented, of the um, carousel, which is where that poem takes place. Um, and uh, you can, I mean, it's, it's in past and future ruins. So Baudelaire sits between the ruins of the past and the ruins of what will be the future. The poet's nostalgia is both for the Paris of the past, which is lost forever, and for a future he believes he will never know, but whose unfinished and temporary ruins already mark the passage of time. Someday, perhaps, he muses, a passerby will give a backward glance at what was once the new Paris. So in a sense, we're back to Thucydides, but with the added stamp of nostalgia. Such a nostalgic pro projection into the future is decidedly romantic. In the visual arts, for example, there is the famous imagined view of the Bank of England in ruins by Gandhi from 1830. Realize the bank has just been built, right? And uh, here's another view. One might say that this is a romantic notion of creating another great era like that of antiquity and its ruins an age that will be seen by future scholars as golden. Such a few a view is in fact suggested by Friedrich Schlegel, you know, theorist of the first romantics at the end of the 18th century. He said, we need a new mythology, right? Why? Because, says Schiller, we need to be greater than the ancient Greeks and Romans and to be remembered as such. Here too, there's the implied presence of ruins though, as it were, textual ones. Schlegel wants to leave a legacy, a trail of documents, that even once fragmented by time, like so many of the classical works today, will for the future comprise the traces of another great antiquity. Now, there's a chilling aspect of such imaginings of the ruins of the present viewed by a distant age to come. And here I'm speaking of Hitler's architect, and director of armaments, ammunition, arms, you get it. <laughs> uh, Albert Speer, who developed what he called a theory of ruin value. If buildings of a great empire are to inspire future generations, they need to be of stone and not iron, which looks ugly, argued Speer. He was walking by uh, <clears throat> near the Reichstag and he saw a, an old railroad yard and he saw iron and he decided this will not do for the thousand year Reich. It needs better looking ruins than this. So he showed a drawing to Hitler on the prospective Haupttribüne that he was building and he imagined it in ivy covered ruins and noted that the buildings, quote, must speak to the future conscience of Germans. Speer's example to Hitler was the Parthenon, a ruined splendor of massive stone blocks. Hitler called Speer's theory on ruins a, quote, bridge to tradition, and approved the plans, much to the horror of those around him who didn't even want Speer to show it to him. Thousands of years from the present, the idea was, a thousand year life was to produce ruins as beautiful as those of antiquity. Speer's vision, quite apart from the political horror of which it is a part, does partake in the romantic view of antiquity as aesthetically <coughs> pleasing, beautiful in its crumbled stones, and suggesting a great legacy. Okay, I'm not saying that the romantics are fascist. Everybody's got that. Uh, I'm saying that it partakes of the re romantic view of antiquity as aesthetically pleasing. So let me pause here and state the obvious. Not all ruins are created by the gentle erosion of time or by the returning claims of nature with its veil of ivy and brambles. The Lisbon earthquake of 1755, for example, was such a total devastation that as one critic puts it, it put an end to the optimism of the first half of the 18th century. I don't know if you can see that, but it's the city in flames after the earthquake. One year later, 
<coughs> this is from 1755. Edmund Burke put out his philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful. You'll recall that Thucydides <coughs> imagined Sparta and Athens in ruins and worried that a future archaeologist might under misunderstand the power of each city, judging as he would only from the remnants. Burke, in his study on the sublime, is on a different tack. He wants to show that we have, quote, a degree of delight, and no small one, in the real misfortunes and pains of others, end quote. We are voyeurs in misfortune, in other words. We can enjoy the sublime as long as, <clears throat> as well as be somewhat terrified by it, so long as, as Kant was to echo, we are ourselves in a safe place. For, writes Burke, terror is a passion which always produces delight when it does not press too close. This might explain, for example, uh, the attraction of Gothic fiction. Terror experience from a safe place, like, you know, reading Ed Edgar Allan Poe in your bed at night when you're 14 or something, and, but you're in a safe place and freaking out. In any case, in his drive to demonstrate our morbid fascination with disaster, Burke, like Thucydides and Speer, imagines the destruction of a city, and in this case, London. So again, he's projecting into the future and looking back, imagining. And although he doesn't name it directly until he, <coughs> directly, the Lisbon earthquake of the previous year is clearly very much in his mind. And I cite here Burke. This noble capital, we're talking about London, right? The pride of England and of Europe. I believe no man is so strangely wicked as to desire to see it destroyed by a conflagration or an earthquake. Though he should be removed himself to the greatest distance from the danger, so in a safe place, right? But suppose that such a fatal accident happened, what numbers from all parts would crowd to behold the ruin? and amongst them many who would have been content never to have seen London in its glory. So it has to do with right morbid message. So we seem easily mesmerized by the remnants of disaster. We crowd to behold ruins. And we have, have we not, we that is we, have ourselves had enough natural disasters of late, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, for example, to know the irresistible lure of seeing devastation and of witnessing nature's increasing power and destructive capacity, so long as we are in a safe place, in front of the television, for example. But what about ruins that are produced unnaturally? Not by time, <clears throat> such as the bombs of World War II that destroyed the towns of England and Germany. In such circumstances, the devastation is immediate and the destruction man-made. The ruins of Berlin in 1945 and the photographs of that event, for example. Among other things, the depiction of such ruins makes it impossible to separate the historico-social from abstract thought. There is not the leisure to meditate nostalgically or to contemplate the meaning of life, lost empires, and mortality. Now, obviously, one could speak here of the ruins in many other places in the world. Uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Vietnam, the Middle East, Lebanon, um, Gaza. But right now, for the purpose of thinking ruins, I'm using Germany, 1945. Here is uh, from, again, it's not good quality, but from the Rossellini movie, uh, <coughs> Germany Year Zero. These are photographs from that film, um, and although this is an actress, the, this is indeed Berlin. This is, uh, I mean, Mussolini filmed it. Consider these photographs with their mute and tragic illustrations in relation to the 19th century enjoyment of ruins with itself titillating contemplation of mortality. These ruins are in your face, as it were. No one knows how sad one had to be, Flaubert had written, to resurrect the city of Carthage. How sad did one need to be to resurrect the city of Berlin? 
And how does the photographic representation of such devastation teach us to reconsider the possibility that life, stripped bare, insists on rebuilding the architecture of modernity that created the carnage? So there's a sort of loop. The photographs of Berlin in ruins, 1945, need no elixir, to use Benjamin's term, to be read. They are there undeniably. But the rapidity with which the city of Berlin was rebuilt collaborated in keeping the gaze averted from the catastrophe. If ever, every historiography is by definition a text written by the conqueror, as Benjamin would have it, for the population that is bombed, the ruins of modern war destroy the sense of the present. Because the destruction is man-made, there cannot be the same sense of fate as in national, uh, natural disaster. That is no doubt one of the reasons why the survivors, observers, or descendants frequently averted their eyes to what was Germany after World War II. That's starting only now to change, starting with Zebald, basically. An aversion that has to do, I think, with our notion of the enemy, our unwillingness to accept the consequences of revenge, and the incapacity, as Hannah Arendt puts it, to focus on horror. So let us note, nevertheless, that memory am and amnesia can be thought of together rather than simply opposed. After the war, Germany will construct monuments to the Shoah. It will create post-ruins, such as the Frauenkirche in Dresden. So I'm going to show you the Frauenkirche in, that's a ruin of Berlin. There's the Frauenkirche in 1880, the Frauenkirche in 1945, under communism in 1967, and in the reconstruction now. <coughs> Completely destroyed in 45, this church was reconstructed after the reunification of Germany. The communists, as you saw, did nothing with it, uh, with 40% of the stone that was retrieved in the rubble. The Frauenkirche thus serves as a monument to the memory of destruction. But that monument, as has often been noted, functions as well as a limit concept. I mean, the monument in general. A limit concept, a receptacle for depositing evil, for veiling in it the architecture that surrounds it. A lot of work has been done on this, right? This is not me. Memory thus begins, becomes forgetting as much for the victims as for the heirs or the barely, vaguely curious. Let's return to Germany year zero, to use the, uh, Rossellini's term. There, <coughs> in this catastrophe, there's a second consideration, an ethical one. In a place, Germany 1945, where culpability and responsibility are incontestable, right? Is thinking about the victims, even in a diffused manner within the general population, restricted? Is it even possible? And by whom? By what law? The ruins of Berlin or Dresden or any number of other German cities in 1945 engage the problem of an ethical response to suffering, to human suffering. Now, I can contextualize here and remind us that the real initial successes in bombardments of the Second World War, Guernica, Warsaw, Belgrade, Rotterdam, was the work of Germany. London, as we know, underwent the blitz between 1940 and 1941, evidence of a formidable German technology. But let us nevertheless think of Berlin 1945 now. Bombed by the Royal Air Force from 1940 to 1945, by the Americans from 1943 to 1945, by the Allied campaign of strategic bombing during most of the war, and by the Red Army in 1945. As the writer Zebald notes, the public file of the Allies shows that the Royal Air Force alone dumped one million tons of bombs in German towns, that there were more than 600,000 dead in the German civilian population, more than two million wounded, hundreds of thousands homeless, entire cities annihilated. 
To this must be added a lack of food, shelter, water, any social services, and basic security. And let us not forget that the Red Army, full of vengeance, looted, murdered, and raped with abandon and rage. More than two million women were raped by the Red Army, of which 130,000 were in Berlin alone. With the bombardments and the ensuing chaos, daily life is gone. There is no state, remember, no law, no recourse, no redress. Okay, let us admit that this elicit an uns elicits an unspoken and difficult juxtaposition, which is the Shoah on the one hand and the victims of the Berlin bombardments at the end of the war on the other. It is a juxtaposition that will shock, insult, but may also unveil a space where forgetting and remembering, as I've been arguing, join. Now, I am not forcing such a juxtaposition, nor am I suggesting forgiveness. That is not the point here. Nor is pity my point, Pache Badu, to whom I will return. Nor am I attempting to displace the Shoah from its central position in all considerations of the Second World War. The Shoah remains inescapable. I am speaking here only of the gaze that considers, in viewing photographs, the status of suffering and its ethical implication. Berlin, 1945. Here is the Brandenburg Gate, now restored and thus a maintained ruin, it is called, that is reconstructed. And also, as many of you know, a main tourist era area. It's a ruin in the sense of how much it was damaged in the war, how it came then to represent the division of East and West, Germany, and finally now symbolizes the reunification and the bombardments and the <coughs> economic success of the German state. The rest of the city, you will notice, flattened here, has long since been restored. Once again, forgetting and remembering are joined. It is precisely a nostalgia for unity that leads Benjamin to argue for a resistance to the symbol, you will remember. The romantic move par excellence, he says, and for allegory. The symbol for Benjamin, by its very economy, represents harmony and perfection, and thus elicits totality through autonomy. The symbol for him passes itself off as a promise of eternal life, and thus professes to surpass time and history. But the ruin for Benjamin, seen allegorically, shows history inside a panorama. You will remember, thus viewed, <coughs> History, quote, does not take the form of a process toward eternal life as much as that of an irresistible decomposition. The allegorical gaze for Benjamin is a way of seeing the history of the world not as a horizontal line, but as a broken and interrupted trajectory. The skull, which Benjamin reminds us is common in the staging of Hauerschwein, shows, quote, the complete subjugation, subjugation of man to death. End quote. For death is that which most deeply incises the broken line that demarks the limit between being and signification. End quote. The ruin is an allegory of this perspective. It allows for escaping the false affirmation of the symbol. A ruin can, through the intervention of such a gaze, accomplish what Benjamin asks, that shock unveil history in time and explode out of the continuum. Benjamin's skull or death head is thus more radical than the skull's empty sockets in the Derrida text we considered earlier. While Derrida's protestations that sockets do not show anything of the all, his denial becomes a kind of epistemological recusatio. That's a very pretentious way for me to put it, but you get the idea, I'm sure. Um, it performs what it contests, and thus, as if in spite of itself, joins a certain romantic perspective. Benjamin's allegorical gaze may be the only hope for extricating ourselves from a pervasive romantic assist insistence on the necessity of overcoming lack and of seeing in the fragment and in the ruin the promise or memory of wholeness. 
the ruins both physical and mental, those left behind by the 20th century in the West, have left a legacy that disallows the notion of unity as an innocent one. Flaubert, as I said, was already onto this with respect to Carthage and the melancholy that it entailed to rebuild it. But melancholy is not the only legacy here of the 19th century. The romantics, argues Benjamin, have, have a perspective. And of course, romantics is way too vague, all right? So you have to forgive me on this. I'm quite aware that it's not true of all of them. Um, it's not the only legacy, let's say, of the 19th century. But Benjamin warned about that perspective, and we would do well to heed him. I'm almost finished, except I'm going to show you a bunch of photographs um, that are from my family. So let's return to Germany year zero. There's a second consideration, because the Second World War produces ruins otherwise. The bombs. <coughs> Uh, that destroyed the towns of England and Germany changed not only the relation to time and the witnessing of destruction, they changed in a certain way, and I don't have time to explain this, the very conception of time itself. To begin with, the witness of the bombing does not precisely have the time, unlike previous ruin gazers, to contemplate the erosion produced by centuries on the great edifices and monuments. Moreover, time is not the cause of the destruction but rather humans with their murderous and instantaneous machines conceived in the logic of modern warfare. Of course, Berlin, I repeat, is far from alone, and that too is a tragedy. So here, wait, now I have to do something very brave. It changes your, uh... okay, I need somebody to come help you, please. I think it's, I can't those have those those over yeah, right. And so <laughs> if I just go like that, <laughs> and then, and then your I'm gonna do my command A, right? So can somebody so hit the lights? I think it'd be better yeah, if you saw okay. this. Yeah, it's so. Uh, okay. So these are Berlin and Brem Bremen. Uh, you saw this one already. It's not going to let me. Are you getting it full screen? Am I going at the right clip? There's a reason for that, which is that initially um, uh, the Englishman in charge of, of bombing Germany decided to bomb civilians. And uh, finally, near the end of the war, uh, he was talked out of that and um, started bombing bridges, railroads, and so forth. And I'm going to just show you one more. Okay, so. Um, let me conclude, if somebody can hit the lights. I mean, I have a lot more, but it's 3.03. Uh, if Bud Yu, I'm, I, I'm really almost finished, okay? If Bud Yu is right in arguing that humanism cannot be grounded in victimization, contra, for example, Hannah Arendt, do we follow him to the notion that man is capable of being immortal, quote unquote, in circumstances that seek to kill him? This is a philosophy of Bagu's, which I see as in extremis, which requires suffering to prove man's capacity to overcome evil. Suffering, therefore, which for Bagu must never serve to define the rights of man, Suffering is essential, nevertheless, to Badu's system. 
for it alone can reveal the immortality of eternal man. This is a dangerous policy, for it forms what I would call a certain luxury that philosophy allows itself at times, an ahistoric perspective that permits the contemplation of catastrophe, one that is reminiscent of how uh, some of the romantics viewed ruins but obviously in a very different context. I mean, it doesn't have the same implications. That is to think in distance and abstraction, to aestheticize, in other words, and thus suppress suffering, to use the photograph as an object for meditation. This is the next step, right? For what is the event truth, as that you would say, that emerges from the bombing of Berlin? We get more help on one level from Levinas, who says that Western philosophy is produced in a manner that refuses to engage the other, that is indifferent to the other, creating useless suffering. And Derrida writes that Levinas is asking neither for sympathy nor compassion, you know, this is in violence and metaphysics, he's rather asking for a responsibility toward the other. With Levinas, you will remember Derrida writes, it is a question of writing an ethics of ethics and not of instituting a system of ethics. This is a view that is convincing, moving, and profound. It also allows for seeing suffering, for condemning and abhorring it. But it doesn't go far enough in a situation such as Berlin in 1945, or I mean. In this situation in Berlin, during and after the bombings, the question remains with these photographs and this issue, what do we do with our gaze? And that's the question that I believe now faces us in 2014. Thank you. Take questions? Sure, sure. Paul? Yeah, um, uh, this is probably actually almost following on from your final question that ties in a lot of thoughts I have, you know, while listening to your, as you're very, uh, st stimulating talk, uh, you know, the question of where the gaze goes. And, so, and this relates to something that you talked about at the beginning and didn't expand upon, which I don't know anything about, you know, which might be, the, which is that distinction between the ruin on the one hand and rubble on the other hand. Uh, and the way this may relate to a distinction that one could make and probably should make between the individual ruin, which possibly can be an object of contemplation, the kind of romantic idealization uh, that you were talking about, and the array of ruins, you know, on the street or, you know, in, in various places juxtaposed with one another, and whether or not one can focus the gaze in that particular context, because even though what you have is, an, a, in a sense, an excess of individuality, because ruination individualizes, it renders something unlike anything else. This right. is building unlike anything else. This building was never built. It just, it became that way, right. you know, as it were, as a result of various, of various processes of destruction. You know, so even though you have an excess of individuality on the one hand, well, uh, you can't focus on any of these individuals, so you just end up with a sense of a mass of destruction, which kind of generalizes itself across an area, and the gaze wanders and has no home. It ends up not being able to go anywhere. You have the panorama instead of focus. You know, mm -hmm. I so I don't know if that relates to that ruin rubble distinction, because I don't know anything about that, even though you know it sounds potentially quite interesting. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but anyway, I don't know if you, how you respond. Well, thank you to for that. that. I mean, what I've discovered in, in doing this uh, work is that having the gaze wander is no more dangerous than having the gaze fixated. Mm -hmm. The problem is how do we construct that gaze when we look at this? I mean, the danger of seeing these photographs, of course, is to aestheticize them mm -hmm. and therefore to anesthetize mm -hmm. the viewer. Um, the, the, I just made a little offhand remark about rubble and ruin because it's as if in an attempt to, sort of what you were saying, in an attempt to come to terms with this devastation. People who work on ruins think they have a handle on things or some kind of control if they make a distinction between rubble and ruin. I mean, there is a distinction, but so what? It's interesting, actually, uh, it, that distinction reminded me of something I watched very recently, again, the beginning of Kuzintsev's King Lear, you know, sort of where the camera pans across stones, which nevertheless at some point include what is clearly a remnant of a, of a building, as the impoverished, you know, sort of walk en masse towards the castle, which is inhabited by, by Leah, and before which are arrayed 
uh, forbidding masses of soldiers you know, sort of, and, the, and the clergy you know, as well. Oh, that's interesting. As Freud said on top of the Necropolis, mm. Saxa la Quintor, you know, mm. stones speak. Mm. Right. Anybody else? Yes? Do you make a distinction between ruins and smoldering ruins? No. Do you think I should? <laughs> I think. Because? Because otherwise, clean ruins are going to be monumentalized, and therefore the gaze, the gaze, let's say, the ethics of ethics uh, of Derrida's uh, reading of, of Levinas will monumentalize and therefore freeze the ethics. Well, OK, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I didn't show you the whole series of Berlin photographs. But what's very interesting when you look at them is, first of all, the early photographs are before monuments are created and there was a cleaning up, right? But what is cleaned up first? And you can see it in the photographs. The streets. Why are the streets cleaned first in this devastation so that the invading armies can get around in their jeeps? So that's the first thing that's cleaned up. The second thing that's cleaned up is stuff on the sidewalk so that people can walk through. So there's this very interesting hierarchy about what gets cleaned up first. Seeing the ruins in the early part of those photographs, that was smoldering ruins. I'm very interested in how the suppression of the horror is mimicked by the cleaning up, because Berlin was shockingly quickly cleaned up. So you're absolutely right. There's a distinction there and one that needs to be thought about. Um, but. The other thing that happens in these photographs is that more and more people begin to see ruins even before they're turned into monuments as a kind of curiosity. Let me show you two pictures which I think are really interesting in this regard. Am I still whatever it is I'm supposed to be? Can you turn your, open the lid on your computer, let's see if it, if it picks it up for me. Yeah, okay, so um, it's the last two. Here are two guys. I think it's these two. No. Mm. Mm. Looking at ruins. Now this is recent, right? This has happened maybe a week before. So nothing has been fixed up or cleaned up or anything else. But they look at them here and then, which I think is really interesting, except Now, are they, have they seen enough? Um, are, they, are they tourists? You know, a tour gazing is, is now a big industry, as many writers on ruins have pointed out. I always think I'm writing on something new and interesting, and it turns out everybody and her aunt is writing on the same <laughs> thing. Um, but you see, you see what I mean? This, this is right now. This is not fixed up yet. The, the, the Cathedral of um, Dresden, the, the Kamenkirche, rather, that I showed you, that there, your point is, of course, well worth taking. I mean, but there are other instances where already look at this gaze. They look at that, and then they turn away and walk. They're busy. They're well-dressed. She's wearing white pants in the middle of this devastation. And there are other photographs, too, that show the attempt to reconstruct life under those circumstances, which is also that's why I'm constantly harping about forgetting and remembering as not being binary opposition. I lived, uh, I lived in Munich, and Munich was even more destroyed than Berlin. So it was Dresden? Somewhere, yeah, somewhere between 95 and 96 percent of Munich was destroyed. And it was very fast rebuilt, uh, being a replica of its own. Like, you wake up in the morning and you realize that it's not your TV set, but it's identical to it. Yes. And the bed sheets are identical to it, and <laughs> you ask yourself whether you are the same. But the difference between Munich, so today Bavaria, uh, the rebuilding of Munich, which was astonishingly quick. Yeah. And of Freiburg. Um, I, I was thinking as, especially of the Nuremberg Cathedral, mm. yeah. uh, which is enormous and monumental and gorgeous. And it took about mm -hmm. 14 years to rebuild to scale. You don't have such a thing in, in Munich, which is a much larger city. But I had this feeling, because I knew the history and the architectonics of the city, and I knew how the city looked before right. and after, it's uncannily identical. So what I meant by, for me, the smoldering ruins is the perfect rebuilding of it. Like the Frauenkirche. Yeah. It's like the Frauenkirche. But or the dome in Berlin. 
yeah, but at least the monumental is somehow stamped on those. Here you have apartment buildings, you have uh, the post amp, uh, things which are normal in uh, in, a, in a city life. Um, and I was very, whenever I go to, uh, to, to Munich, I feel very uncannily about it. Because there is some, and this is what I meant by smoldering ruins, there is let's say, to, to go back into, into Benjamin, a relationship between the original and the reproduction Absolutely. that constitutes the smoldering ruin, which is the counter aura space. Yes. Although it's not clear that the original one was... An no, 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 no. No, but it's retroactively, right, the, right, the right. aura is killed in its, in its effigy. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and I mean, I think the dome in Berlin or the Frauenkirche and any number of other vast monuments that were rebuilt after the war, rebuilt with, you know, getting as much of the rubble precisely as you can to use it in order to argue for a form of authenticity. Uh, this is really the dome. We have really gotten 40% of it and so forth. Um, to do that is a good example of the extent to which such an, an immense rebuilding of a ruined monument becomes a receptacle for forgetting. Right, because there it is, so that takes care of that. Um, it, it's, you know, like, um, and, and I, I, I mean, other people like Hoysen has written about this, and, uh, um, but it is an interesting problem in terms of when something becomes a monument, it also becomes a, res a receptacle for repression. Um, mm -hmm. and, and of course the monument, you also have maintained ruins, that is, this is also very weird. That is, ruins that already exist and have not been fixed and are there to be shown, but they're starting to crumble, so they have to shore them up with concrete. And so you're maintaining the ruin, which is a kind of oxymoron of sorts, right? No. No, it looks funny, and, uh, and it's a clownish idea. No, the Reichstag for 40 years was uh, actually rebuilt as a ruin. But the question is, because you cannot have the ruin of a ruin. Well, yes, you can. I just explained one. I no. just said, if you have a ruin that you are displaying as a part of history and so forth, and that ruin starts falling apart even more than it already was, you, ha you can have the ruin of a ruin, and, and your only option is to shore it up so it doesn't collapse, in which case, it, it, the whole talk about original and copy, I mean, you can't even remember. I mean, we don't need daily doubt to remind us that you can't figure out where the copy went, not, not to mention the original. See what I mean? It's the yeah, I see what you mean, but I don't agree because a ruin which is maintained to show, mm -hmm. you know, whether the Reichstag or it's not a real whatever, ruin. You're say. It's not a ruin. I mean, it's put to work. Well, that's what I'm this saying. This deservement of the, the I ruin. I know, but that ruin that's being put to work can also become a ruin. Ah, sure, that's it generates its own material ruin. Right, right, and when sure. so that would be the ruin of a ruin. But what I'm saying is, what's even more interesting in terms of artificiality is when such ruins are shored up with brick and mortar to prevent them from getting ruined. And so, I mean, the whole thing, it, it, the more I get into this, the more complicated. I've been working on this for two years, and um, it's horribly complicated. For example, in Berlin, of course, there was the bunker where Hitler was. Nobody, kn well, somebody knows, but most people don't know where that is because they're afraid it will be turned into a shrine, Yeah. right? And yet, the Reichstag was ruined. Um, and so you have, I mean, see what I mean? Were so you mean, did, did it not get built over when they did Potsdamer Platz, or did they kind of preserve it somewhere or other? It, well, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I was just well, wondering. It's a bunker. It's, yeah. it's a bunker, so, yeah. yeah. What were you going to say? First, I wanted to echo uh, Paul's suggestion that this was a wonderful time. Thank and you. And thank you so much for it. Uh, and, and I got two questions. One, one's purely factual. Could you say a few words about the family archive, of, of, of how it came to you? And, and where it comes from. It's so interesting that everybody wants to know that. <laughs> that's, that's one, and maybe if you don't feel comfortable talking. No, I feel very comfortable. That's fine. Uh, but my question was to come back to the question of the aesthetics of ruins uh, and the danger of aestheticizing the ruin, and Diderot's anxiety about the human in, that, in the, the poetics of the ruin. Why is it that the human, or the presence of the human, even in the images that you showed, seem to dispel the aura of the ruin? To what degree are we looking at a well, so a kind of nostalgia for a world in which there are no humans at all? Which yes. we can imagine that future in which the human itself has disappeared. I think the that's happening as we speak. Has. Yes, 
Um, I, I think with, with Diderot, what I was trying to suggest was that the shift, of which he is a part, is on solitude as a kind of melancholy necessity for contemplation, which is a sort of romantic yeah. theme. So this, right? the single self contemplating the ruin is okay. It preserves. It, it preserves the the intensity of the contemplation. When there's too much noise and there are too many people walking around, it's hard to concentrate, right? I mean, look at Goethe and the Tischbein painting. I mean, you can. There's a million other paintings I could have chosen, but it's sort of almost a cartoon of how solitude in this period becomes a sort of privileged status, which it doesn't have as a status beforehand. I mean, none of the people, I mean, you realize I spent all this time telling you about former views and galloping through the ages, as I said, because you really need to see what happens in the 19th century with ruins that become an obsession in many ways, and then what happens in the 20th century. And what I'm trying to argue, among other things, is that in the, in the 18th century, the latter part of the 18th century, solid, solitude becomes a kind of uh, value. As to where I got these pictures, um, my mother, who um, was French and lived in Paris during the occupation, um, uh, when she married my father, who was um, a diplomat, she could no longer, he couldn't serve any longer because his wife was French and she might have been a spy. Um, and so he was sent to Germany. And uh, my mother, who hated the Germans, having lived under the occupation, um, was horrified by the ruins and by, you know, the German population was starving. I mean, they weren't just... And uh, so she took photographs, and she said that in every photograph she was torn between human pity and a feeling serves you right, because, you know, she was shot at a bunch of times and all that sort of thing in, uh, by the Gestapo. But I, I think that... Um, this is, this is part of the issue, but um, what's interesting is how, and I'm not speaking about you, but how, how people really want to know who took the photographs. And I'm, I'm usually reluctant, but you asked your question in such an interesting way, I wasn't. I'm reluctant to tell them because, I mean, like when I gave this talk at the Sorbonne, there was this woman who drove me crazy after my talk and said, who took the pictures? And I said, if I tell you it was somebody who was Jewish, you won't see them the same as if I tell you it was a German person, or a French person, or a male, or a female. Um, so in a way, I'm not going to talk about I mean, this is not an autobiographical project. And I think it's important not to know who took the photographs and to see what you're going to do with it. It's sort of like Wayne Booth, the rhetoric of fiction, I mean, 26 ways of to mix my metaphors with Wallace mm -hmm. Stevens of looking at, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> you know, photographs. But uh, what's very interesting in these photographs, you can see the extent to which people start paying less and less attention to the ruins mm -hmm. and, and start, you know, quite understandably, rebuilding a daily life. Um, yes? Um, this is a quick question, a little bit going back to what Colleen was saying. I'm wondering what you make of specifically the museum that's now at Ground Zero and how... You mean in the States? Yeah, in New York. Oh. And, yeah. There's a perfect example. What? Well, <laughs> what, what you, how you commemorate, how you... Yeah, that's what I was sort of getting yeah. at. I mean, how, how you think, I mean, in a gesture like that, for example, as opposed to what you were saying before about a sort of perfect reconstruction that... Um, yeah, it restores the ruin. Well, remember one of the, I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but one of the ideas was to reconstruct the towers exactly as they had been. Yeah. Or at least to have a work of art that would depict the towers exactly as they were. And it was rejected with the idea that now it's time to do something new and better and so forth. Uh, obviously, this project could also be about that. It could be about the ruins in Lebanon, which a great deal of interesting work has been done in. It could be other ruins in Palestine more recently. Mm -hmm. um, there's any number of places you can go with this. I'm trying to, I, I have to use one thing, because I, if I do everything, I'll lose my mind, right? Um, so, and furthermore, I don't know, if, I mean, there's just too much that I don't know. But by using these images, apart from the fact that they have a certain <coughs> I'm slightly cathected to them, we can say. I mean, it was way before, I'm happy to refer it, before I was born, so I wasn't there. I'm not someone in a buggy being, you know. Um, but uh, I think 
you have to have a metonymic piece that you can work with. Um, otherwise, it's impossible. And this is my metonymic piece. And I'm very interested in it because the Germans, I mean, I spend a lot of time in Germany, and the Germans that I've spoken to never want to look at it. I wanted to give this talk in Berlin about six months ago, because I was invited to give a talk in Berlin, and they said, you can talk about anything you want. But, uh, yeah. So I said, okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the ethics of ruins in Berlin, 1945. You know what they said? <coughs> you know, German will love this. They said, das wäre unangenehm und gefährlich, which means unpleasant and dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, Un unpleasant, yeah, I get that, but dangerous? <laughs> well, see, that's what's interesting. I'm always interested in what people don't want to look at. That's one of my pet <laughs> things. So that I wrote, I did this uh, book of essays on the saint. Um, uh, saints, everything from Elvis Presley is, you know, the first saint of Protestantism, which was, I mean, I edited this. I did not write about Elvis Presley. You know, I wouldn't be capable because I don't know enough. But um, anyway, the whole idea that you know, the cool people in theory today don't look at religion because if you're cool, how can you be religious? Well, I mean, that's just, you know, I'm really interested in that embarrassment. Yes. I'm interested in the embarrassment of Germans who don't want to look at Germany in 1945, including people for whom it is not necessarily painful because they weren't born and they didn't lose any family and they're not from, I mean, you know. so. This is a question of the gaze. It's a political question of the place of the state inside, because this was a stateless moment. Um, and it's a question of attempting to anesthetize yourself to human suffering and what the answer is. I mean, obviously the answer is somewhere between Hannah Arendt, who assumes all sorts of things, all sorts of things that we don't you know, necessarily believe anymore. And on the other hand, someone like Baidu, who I think is scandalous. Um, so. Yeah. That, I'm sorry, that was a long answer. Yes. Um, I have what I think is a really brief question, but I just wondered if you could comment, perhaps, um, because you're building this idea of the gaze, which obviously has something explicitly to do with the photograph. But I wondered if you could comment on um, this idea of the preserved ruin, um, or what Kumi has called the smoldering ruin, and its relationship to the photograph of the ruin. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Um, and I, I have not figured it out. Okay. I'm trying to figure out, I mean, okay, there's two problems going on. One, I'm worried, following Benjamin in a certain way, that since we have photographs of the devastation, we will end up reading the photographs in a, the same aesthetic way with which, you know, Lamartine goes and sits on top of a bunch of ruins and starts talking about eternity, right? That's the first problem. The second problem is if you don't do that, if you guard against doing that, then what do you do? I mean, I can get all fancy and start talking about Lacan and the gaze. That's not going to get me anywhere, right? Um, I, I can. It's true that allegory for Benjamin will save us from the symbol, and I think there is a real danger there. But it doesn't help. So I'm trying now to read photographic theory, about which I previously knew nothing, and figure out how, I mean, my question is, if you don't do this, and you don't do that, and you don't do this other thing, and you particularly are, want to be careful not to do this, how do you construct the gaze in looking at this stuff? You can do a Hayden White number and say, no matter what you do, you're going to start telling stories. I had a bunch of photographs, and I ordered them. But there was not necessarily an order, and I ordered them in order to be able to tell a story, which is obviously false. I was thinking yeah, of a doubling, uh, because obviously the concrete is the ruin of an abstract. Either uh, the proleptic one, the blueprint, or the retrospective, etc. Mm -hmm. So in what sense maybe uh, Bruno Latour would be interesting here with the realized yes. resistance, etc. And what means geology, so how a ruin falls into geological strata. And archaeology. Yeah. But I was thinking of uh, maybe two ways around. One of them would be to distinguish between gaze and glance. And what kind of yeah. temporal imposition right. uh, ruins uh, present us with you know, when it comes to this. But also, who is doing the gazing? No, 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 sure, I mean, sure, sure. No, but I wouldn't get obsessed with the gaze. Right, right. No, I. And the second one, I don't know, have you ever lived in a ruin? I spent a lot of time in ruins when I was... I lived in a ruin. I was I, in the Romanian army and were living in a ruin. It wasn't the ruin of a monument. 
it's a completely different setting. Can, can I finish what I was saying a second ago? When I grew up playing in ruins in Germany, so I know just what you mean. Okay. I mean, I didn't sleep there, but I was there all the time. Yeah, sleeping makes a difference, but I was about 19 when I had to do it. So yeah, that's different. Well, one of the things I want to do at the end of this project, which, you know, if I continue like this, I'll be writing about when I'm in my 90s, um, is um, uh, there's a, an artist who, when I first saw his work, I was sure it was my age because he saw Germany in the same way that a child sees Germany and as I saw it. And that's Anselm Kiefer. And he, I have, I'm going to have a last chapter on him because he really asked that question. And his latest stuff is, strangely enough, on ruins. Um, and he's got some installations of ruins in um, city uh, spaces and in vacant lots and so forth. And uh, so he's asking the question with a different medium, and I have to think about that too. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, I, I think so. And I mean, it's interesting. Um, that you went to installation art because I wonder, and I've done some work on this myself, about the relationship between photograph, which is obviously surface, right, um, and implies a certain degree of distance, and something like an installation, which is, in a lot of senses, um, inhabited in a certain way. Right. Which, I think, changes the um, structure of a room. And perhaps with the gaze. Yeah, I mean, but there are plenty of photographs in here that my mother took that are of smoldering ruins, right? Mm -hmm. You saw that, but many of them have, I mean, you don't see ruins anymore. I mean, there were still some ruins in East Berlin, for example, because the communists never got around to cleaning it up, but that was quickly taken care of with reunification. Um, there, there are a lot of very interesting photographic projects having to do with that, including uh, this guy whose name is Gates me who does photography of the 30s Jewish quarters in East Berlin and then in, superimposes, have you seen this? Superimposes uh, what it is now and so you have a feeling that there's ghosts. I mean, it's very interesting work. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of, thank you for your question, there's a, there's a lot of work to do. But this is interesting stuff. Oh, it's so interesting. It's smoldering. <laughs> Man, it's amazing. Thank you for your patience and for listening. Oh, this was great. Thank you so much. Thank you.